prehistoric Africa. A great cat preys on an extraordinary creature. After a fierce chase, an ancient pre-human animal meets its bloody end. Six million years later, members of the community museums of Kenya are excavating in the Tugan Hills, a remote and rugged area in the northeast of the country. This part of Kenya is thought to hide many ancient hominid remains, and the team hopes that the current dig season will bring the big find. Here in a part of Africa, that's often called the cradle of humanity. They are searching through six million year old layers of rock for evidence of our earliest ancestors. They won't have long to wait. October 21st, 2000. Kiptalam Chaboy makes an amazing discovery. I was walking along the ground that was once a stream. As I looked closer, I saw something that struck me. When I looked more closely, I could see there were human teeth. When I saw that, my whole body was filled with excitement. If I had jumped for joy, I would have hit the sky. The fossilized teeth amazed the team, for they appeared to have many characteristics of modern human teeth. And other fossils soon followed. The team had chanced upon a cache of bones from an ancient predator. Leading the search were scientists Martin Pickford and Brigitte Sanu. When I found it, all you could see was the head like that. The erosion had removed the sediment from around it. And I picked it up, and actually this bit stayed in the ground, only the head came up, but I could see this break here. You see the crack? So I ducked carefully, <clears throat> and I found this bit, and then this bit was attached, and then there was a third bit. And then this, unfortunately, was missing. The, the lower end of the femur was missing. And that would have been beautiful to have that, but unfortunately it's not there. And we dug all this trench to, looking for the rest of it, but never got it. What Martin had uncovered was a femur, or thigh bone. Like the teeth, it appeared to be uncannily human. Might the fossils be from a hominid, an early pre-human ancestor? Brigitte was searching through the rock nearby when she made another breakthrough. She found a humerus, or upper arm bone. I was uh, walking here in the, sh in, the, in the sun, it was lunchtime, we were going back to the camp. And sticking out of this area was a little piece of bone, like that. And I picked it up, and it was obvious to me from the morphology it was a piece of the humerus. And it took me about a week to stick all the pieces together. Within two weeks, the count stood at 13 fossil fragments from five different individuals of a creature new to science. But the real headline was that these bones seemed to be far more ancient than any other hominid find. At six million years old, they were poised to shed light on the very genesis of the human species. It stretches human history way back, and we're seeing the opening chapters of human origins here. Because the discovery of the bones was made in the year 2000, the find was nicknamed Millennium Man, but its scientific name would embrace a local fable. It's now being christened scientifically as Aurorin tugenensis. 
Ororin is the Tugan word for the original man, and they have a legend in their mythology about the original inhabitant of this region, and he's called Ororin. So uh, this name was suggested to us by the local people, and we thought it was quite a pleasant name. Because Aurore in French is dawn, and that also is fairly appropriate. Unfortunately, Aurore in Italian means horror, which is <laughs> which is not so good. But um, Ororin is now the official scientific name for this uh, species, or uh, the genus, and then Ororin tugenensis for the species. <laughs> February 2001. A news conference is called to announce the stunning discovery. Martin and Brigitte bring their controversial claim to the world's attention, declaring that they have found the oldest known pre-human ancestor. If they are right, the implications are enormous. Nothing like this has ever been seen in the hotly debated field of early human evolution. Martin, a geologist and paleontologist, has been searching for fossils for more than 30 years. For him, discovering what appears to be an early human ancestor is the find of a lifetime. Being a scientist, and I try and be a good scientist, it's an ongoing thing. To make a really big breakthrough obviously doesn't happen that frequently, and when it does happen, it's, it's quite exciting. Yeah. Brigitte is a specialist in fossil morphology, the study of ancient skeleton structures. She and Martin are based here at the French National Museum of Natural History, one of the oldest museums of its type in the world. Their find has placed them on the brink of a radical and revolutionary new theory about how humans evolved. It's not in an easy position, but uh, don't forget that science don't proceed or don't get better with established ideas. The established idea that Martin and Brigitte are challenging relates to one of the great puzzles of evolution. Why do humans walk on two feet when almost all of our closest relatives walk on four? Brian Richmond from the University of Illinois is an expert on bipedalism. Walking on two legs is a thing that defines the human family tree. Not the things we might think of, like the ability to speak, the ability to create art, or abstract thinking. Um, in the early fossil record, we don't see evidence of those things, but we do see evidence that they're walking upright. So uh, what we look for in the earliest human origins is evidence of this upright walking. Until now, the evidence has all pointed towards one theory about how we learn to walk. It is the time-honored savanna hypothesis. Ten million years ago, equatorial Africa was covered with thick forest. But then, tectonic activity in the Earth's crust caused the land in the east to rise. As the land became higher, rainfall in the region was reduced, and the forest began to die out eventually becoming open savanna. The theory goes that upright walking must have appeared in response to the open land, a concept embraced in one of the most famous images in all of science, the ascent of man. The poster child for the Savannah Hypothesis is a creature found in 1974. Her name is Lucy, and she was found by paleoanthropologist Don Johansson. On that uh, November day in 1974, when I was on my way back to my Land Rover, I was heading back to camp because it was noontime, it was 110, 115 degrees, and I was thinking about taking a shower, uh, going for a swim in the river. And as I looked over my shoulder, I saw a tiny little piece of arm bone that was the first signal that there was something unique here, something different. And as I kneeled down to look at it and pick it up, my graduate student said, what makes you think it's from a human ancestor? And I said, 
I think it goes with those pieces of skull next to your hand. And as we looked up the slope, we could see glistening in that noonday sun, uh, pieces of ribs, uh, pieces of a pelvis, uh, parts of an arm, bits of a leg, uh, a piece of a jaw. And all of a sudden it clicked. Here was an associated specimen, an associated skeleton, more than three million years old. This was going to turn out to be important. I think what made Lucy so special was um, a combination of her antiquity, the fact that she was 3.2 million years old, uh, that she was roughly 40% complete, the combination of a skeleton that old, that complete, uh, caught everybody's attention in anthropo anthropological circles. I mean, she became an instant hit. Lucy's age was staggering at the time. 3.2 million years old. Time, on such a large scale, is hard to comprehend. But it is possible to put into a human perspective. Take a single modern human and place a parent behind him, and then a parent behind that, and so on. Generation after generation stretches into the past, forming a line of spectacular proportions. The first of our kind, modern Homo sapiens, are 100,000 years old and first appear about three miles down this line. To find a species like Homo habilis, which lived more than two million years ago, requires a 60-mile journey back in time. Traveling even further back into our ancestral past, there are fewer and fewer landmarks. 96 miles down the line and 3.2 million years into prehistory, we eventually find Lucy. What made Lucy so important is the fact that her skeleton clearly shows she was a biped, but she walked on two feet. Because of her age and her bipedalism, Lucy fit perfectly into the established picture of bipedal evolution. An upright walking ancestor that lived around 3.2 million years ago at the time of the expanding savanna, well after the deforestation of East Africa had begun. But now, that theory and Lucy's place within it are being challenged. For if Aurorin really is a six million year old hominid, we will be taken deeper into the past than ever, to a time when the conventional wisdom has not even been tested let alone applied. This is a period of time from which we have three or four fossils that you could fit into the palm of your hand. And anything that would be found in this time period of five, six million years has to be important. The bones' lasting significance will depend, however, not just on their age, but on where they are placed on the human evolutionary tree. We're really dealing with an infinitesimally small and we hope representative part of the fossil record and trying to draw out details about human evolution from those few remains. It is a daunting task, for although there is only one surviving species of humans today, our evolution was a convoluted one. For evolution is about populations, populations that sometimes split to form new species, and other times die off in evolutionary dead ends. Determining any single fossil's place in this chaos is an immense challenge. For a long time, anthropologists have uh, speculated that the, that the recent ancestor, the common ancestor to uh, both the living African apes and uh, those branches that evolved into uh, hominids, uh, was to be found somewhere between 6 and 10 million years ago in Africa. The map of human evolution is constantly being redrawn as new discoveries fill in holes in the record. But scientists generally agree 
that hominids split from apes over six million years ago. Was Aurorin present when the split occurred? Martin and Brigitte believe that Aurorin really is a six million year old hominid and that it has the potential to revolutionize our understanding of human evolution. But are they jumping the gun? Are the bones really as old as they believe? We can't actually date the fossils directly themselves, but what we can do is date the strata in which they occur and then extrapolate that date to the fossil. The geology of this region helps. The area is known as the Lucano Formation, an ancient lake basin formed by a giant lava flow that poured from one of the massive volcanoes scattered across eastern Africa. That lava flow is huge. It, it extends for 50 or 60 kilometers north-south and about 60 or 70 kilometers east-west. And it formed the, the floor of this lake basin where these sediments, the Lucano Formation, accumulated. This bottom layer of lava is called trachyte. The sediment containing Aurorin's bones collected above it. Then, a second flow of basalt lava created the icing on the geological layer cake. Both lava layers can be dated, so the bones found in the middle can be placed within a well-defined slice of prehistoric time. So we're basically in a kind of sandwich with trachyte dated at 6.2 million years below, and these basalt lavas at 5.65, covering the sediments. So Aurorin lies somewhere in between. To try and get a more exact date for the top and bottom layers of lava, the team calls in a group of scientists from the University of Shimane in Japan. The scientists will use the shifting properties of the Earth's magnetic field to determine the date of the lava that lies above and below Aurorin. When this rock was in its molten state, tiny magnetic crystals formed within it. As the lava cooled, the crystals all came to rest, pointing in the same direction along the Earth's magnetic field, just like the needle of a compass. Every few thousand years, however, the Earth's magnetic poles reverse. When this happens, a compass needle would point in the opposite direction. The crystals in the corresponding layers of rock do the same. These different layers, each with its own crystalline fingerprint, can be sequenced and turned into a geological timeline. The results are encouraging. The rocks in which Aurorin was found are between 5.8 and 6.1 million years old. But even though the rock samples have been firmly dated, there is still a small chance that the bones may not be from the same period as the rock. I actually had nightmares for the next about two weeks, thinking, you know, are these things really as old as six million years? There has been histories of, of discoveries in Kenya in particular, but elsewhere in the world, where the discoverers claimed they were very ancient, and they turned out to be much younger. Because the site is a dried up water course, it is possible that the bones had simply washed there out of much younger rocks. This would put the value of the find in jeopardy. The specter of displaced bones is one that haunts all fossil hunters. But there is a way to be almost certain that the fossils do come from the sediments in which they were found. The team looks at the huge variety of other fossilized creatures that accompanied Aurorin's remains. In the Lucano formation where we found Aurorin, we also found other mammals, such as elephants, horses, hippopotamus, pigs, and so on. And by the evolutionary stage of those creatures, those fossils, we can also guess the age. And as soon as we found Aurorin, we looked around and found other fossils. And we could say straight away, yeah, this is late Miocene in age. So it's got to be around about six million years. 
Because the fossilized remains of ancient animals have already been accurately dated to six million years old at other sites, their presence alongside Auroran is further confirmation that Auroran is from the same period. In addition, all the fossils, including Aurorans, are encrusted with a coating derived from freshwater algae, indicating that they are from the same site. There is now little doubt about the date of the bones Martin and Brigitte have found. Little doubt that they are in fact six million years old. You're seeing a picture which nobody ever saw before. Previously the oldest known hominid was about 4.2, now we're at six million. This discovery is, is, is very significant in terms of its chronology because it is getting back in time very close to that period when we think there was a common ancestor to the modern African apes and ourselves. So what was this six million year old creature like? And more importantly, how can we be sure it really was an early hominid? The accepted wisdom is that bipedalism is the defining factor of early human evolution. So Martin and Brigitte will need to show that Auroran really did walk upright. Doing so would not only suggest that Auroran is our earliest known ancestor, it would also indicate that upright walking itself is far older than scientists had previously realized. Making the claim that any animal this age was walking upright is an incredibly important conclusion for paleoanthropology. It's a very important issue. So we'd like to have the entire skeleton or at least a, a good portion of the lower limb to be able to, to make this conclusion. Unfortunately, for the auroran remains, we don't have the knee joint. The lack of the knee joint is a setback because the knee is the easiest way to tell if an animal walked on two legs or four. Because humans walk upright, our knees are specially adapted to give us a smooth and efficient stride. Apes, on the other hand, have their knees far apart, and this difference shows up in the shapes of the bones. If you imagine a human standing there like I am now, You've got your body weight coming down onto your hips. It's going down into your thigh bones, which are angled into the knee bone, the knee joint, and then straight down to the floor. And this is important because it makes for smooth walking. Rather than walking like a chimp with a lot of lateral movement, a human can walk with almost no movement of his hips. So you've got the whole of your body weight coming down through two joints into the knees and straight down. And for that to happen, the thigh bones have to be angled in humans. This angle is seen when the knee joint is placed on a flat surface. If the bone leans outwards, like this human bone does, the animal is certain to have walked on two feet. But with the knee missing, this crucial test cannot be applied to Auroran. The team will have to look elsewhere for clues. Bone is very much a living tissue, it's very dynamic. So uh, in a bone, there's a little bit of, of history of the activity of what happened in that animal. And that's what we'd like to get at in, uh, uh, in eventually, is to look inside these bones for clues as, as to how these bones were loaded when the animal was alive. One particular detail on the surface of the thigh bone provides just such an insight. This is a femur of all rain. And there is one feature which has been linked with bipedalism, is this groove here, very well marked for one of the ligaments of one of the muscles, which helps to keep the leg towards, bring the legs towards the, the body. This muscle runs from the back of the thigh bone and connects to the front of the pelvis. In a four-legged animal, it has a straight path. But in a biped, the joint is extended so that the muscle becomes stretched and is wrapped around the neck of the femur, creating a groove in the bone. If that groove is present as it is in Aurora, there is a suggestion there that the hip acted in a way very similar to our own, meaning uh, that this creature was bipedal. 
The groove is a sign that Auroran might have walked upright. But alone, it is not enough. Other primates, such as gorillas, can also have this groove. The more convincing proof of bipedalism must be found. Fortunately, modern medical technology can examine parts of the six million year old bones that are invisible to the human eye. Since we bear our weight on the hip joint, that weight causes the neck to bend down, creating stress on the top and the bottom of the neck. But there's also a muscle that pulls on this bone right here, and that reduces the stress at the top, but adds more stress at the bottom. In a bipedal animal, the underside of the neck becomes thicker to support the extra weight. It is this hidden feature that can provide the critical answer to how Auroran walked. So if Auroran has thick bone on the bottom and thin bone on the top, then it would provide really good evidence that this thing walked on two legs. That inside of the bone and that pattern tells us what the animal was actually doing with its limbs while it was alive. Now we can't see that with the fossil itself. We'll have to see x-rays or CT scans of the inside of the neck to be able to tell. The fossils are brought to a hospital in Toulouse, France. Here, a CT, or computer tomography scanner, a device normally used to diagnose illness in living people, will produce a three-dimensional image that shows the ancient bone's hidden structure. These are consecutive slices through the top of the fossilized bone. First, they show the ball-like head of the femur, which appears as a circle. Then, as they descend into the neck, the amazing level of detail in this ancient thigh bone becomes apparent. Every hollow and ridge is clearly visible. The computer builds a three-dimensional model, which can then be sectioned off to reveal the thickness of the bone in the critical neck area. At last, the vital evidence has been found. Thicker bone on the underside of the neck, there to support the weight of an early hominid as it walked on two feet. Oran is, is something apart from the apes. Walking, running, standing was a major part of the repertoire of this animal or this creature and it shows in the bones. It was adapted for that kind of behavior and it shows that adapt adaptation in its bones. The discovery proves that bipedalism is much older than has generally been thought. For the accepted wisdom claim that our ability to walk upright only evolved around the time that Lucy's kind walked on the open savanna. But if bipedalism occurred before the forest proceeded, what could have compelled our earliest ancestors to stand up? What drove us to begin to walk on two feet, rather than on the four we had been using as apes for millions of years? The reason for the emergence of bipedalism is one of the great mysteries of human evolution. Bipedalism is a very rare thing to see in mammals, um, even in animals as a whole. We know birds walk on two legs, but there's a very compelling reason. They have wings um, and their upper limbs that are so specialized um, that they can't use those limbs for weight support, so they walk on two legs. Um, if humans had wings, then we would you know, have the answer right there, but we don't. So there must be some other very compelling reason for humans to have begun walking on two legs. So why did our earliest ancestors become bipedal? What advantages could bipedalism have granted to an evolving species?
Mark Rybert is an expert in robotics. He believes we can gain much insight into animal locomotion by analyzing the way his robots move. We're very interested in the relationship between the robots we build and, and biology, how people and animals work when they locomote. And the relationship between those has two parts. There's what looking at the knowledge about animals uh, tells us when we're trying to design robots. But there's also an opportunity to use what we learn about building robots to help in understanding how people and animals work. Based at MIT, Mark has built some of the most extraordinary striding robots ever seen. They come in all shapes and sizes. His experiments help illustrate what advantages a two-legged creature has over a four-legged one. One of the things we found out is that it was much easier to build a robot with fewer legs than with more legs. So a biped was much easier to develop and to make work than a quadruped, uh, largely because the complexity of coordinating the legs was reduced, the mechanical complexity was reduced by not having all the additional uh, mechanisms and actuators. Just as a bipedal robot is more efficient than a robot with four legs, a two-legged animal is in many ways more efficient than a four-legged one. With fewer limbs to control, a biped can transport itself successfully, yet use less of its body to achieve the task. It can use its natural instability to its advantage when moving. Bipeds are highly maneuverable and extremely agile. But perhaps most importantly, walking on two legs liberates the other limbs and frees up the hands for other uses. Rybert's robots demonstrate efficiency, flexibility, and maneuverability, all advantages that an ape would possess if it became bipedal. But doing so would have been no easy task. In order to reap the benefits of upright walking, an exceptional sense of balance would have become vital. In order to achieve that, you have to have a control system that can maintain its balance when just two feet are on the ground or one foot is on the ground, and when it's running, when no feet are on the ground. And so that's a big challenge. Learning to balance and walk upright would have been immensely difficult for our earliest ancestors. It is a process that has never been fully explained by the savanna hypothesis. Anatomist Robin Crompton has been trying to come up with a viable explanation. He has been using computers to try and determine how the shift occurred. There's been a long-running debate between two different groups who are analyzing exactly the same fossil remains but in two very different and up to now incompatible ways. One group held that early hominids would have walked upright in an erect, straight position. Others claimed our ancestors would first have moved with a slouching, bent knee, bent hip gait. We made a computer model based on our information from the literature and from other scientists and gave them body builds of different kinds of apes. Robin tested the two walking styles, upright and erect like modern humans, then the bent knee walk. What we did discover is that the mechanical energy costs, that is the work that the muscles must do to sustain the motion, was approximately twice as high in the model which is walking in a bent knee and hip gait. The inefficiency of the bent knee gait raises doubts about whether or not it ever actually occurred in early hominids. Perhaps there is a better explanation for our evolution from four legs to two. Robin believes that one creature alive today may hold the answer. It's one of the rarest animals in the world. The 
the orangutan. For us, the orangutan is a fascinating animal, not only attractive, but scientifically fascinating, because it may, of all the great apes, be our best model for the origins of bipedality. The name orangutan means forest man in Indonesia. And while they don't come from Africa, and they are not our closest living relatives, they do display behavior and adaptations that may hint at how we developed bipedalism. Here at Chester Zoo in the United Kingdom, Robin has been using special high-speed video cameras to film these animals' unique way of walking, which, unlike chimpanzees, is remarkably similar to ours. The uh, hip joint is very extended, that is, the leg goes behind the uh, body. And you won't see a chimpanzee do that. And this is linked to their uh, behavior in the uh, high levels of, of the forest canopy gathering, gathering fruit and moving on fairly small vines and using their body to, uh, rather like a, almost like a spider to reach out for branches, to reach out for food. In the wild, these animals hardly ever come down to the ground, preferring to spend almost all their time 200 feet up in the forest canopy. Yet they often support almost all their weight on their hind legs, and their habitat supplies them with the perfect environment in which to develop an acute sense of balance. Trees are perhaps the ideal nursery for the evolution of, of, of human walking because they enable an animal to balance itself. They can reach out in any direction, everywhere, below them, above them, to the side of them, they'll find branches that they can touch. For me then, the evidence is increasingly strong that bipedalism did not arise on the ground, but arose in the trees. A creature that is basically arboreal that needs to cross from patch of trees to patch of trees. If they're bipedal, they have an advantage. They don't have to change the body too much. They come down to the ground, their bodies are already upright from being in the trees. They cross the ground upright and they climb up the next patch of trees to get food. They don't have to modify the body too much. The evidence is beginning to add up. And Robin's research seems to cast further doubt on the belief that bipedalism only evolved after the emergence of the open savanna. Instead, the orangutans, the robots, and now aurora are pointing towards a much earlier transition to upright walking in a more wooded setting. The discovery of aurora's bones is forcing us to re-examine our understanding of when why and how upright walking first occurred. Our perceptions are being turned on their head. One thing that's emerging now, uh, and, and Aurora and the discovery of Aurora really reinforces this, is the idea that bipedalism is an adaptation that arose in a more forested environment and was a pre-adaptation in many ways to when they did move out onto the savanna grasslands. So if bipedalism really did emerge in the trees, the iconic image of human evolution may need some revision. The sort of classic image of a quadrupedal ape-like creature, such as a chimp for example, gradually becoming upright, going through all the stages of tottering and up to become fully upright. I think that's, that's to be thrown in the wastebasket. <laughs> I may be wrong, but I, I, just, I really think that's that idea should be removed from the list of hypotheses about hominid origins. Rather than the typical portrayal of evolution, this would be a more accurate picture. Our ancestors have been upright for at least six million years. But in order to be sure that the new picture is correct, Martin and Brigitte 
must have proof that the area where Aurorin was found really was wooded six million years ago. Once again, their confirmation comes from the large number of other fossils that have been excavated at the site. Most were from animals that lived in or near a forest. Monkeys and small antelope were particularly common, and there was plenty of water. You've got lots of impala mm -hmm. and it's quite a lot of colobus monkeys. Yeah. So it's Maybe we've got a lot of uh, hippos as well, huh? Well, there's hippos and there's crocs and, things, and snails, and there's freshwater snails here. Yeah. But I, I think the remains paint a picture of a region that was at least partially forested. But what evidence is there of Aurorin's place within this ecosystem? How did this early hominid split its time between the trees and the ground? Back in Paris, Martin and Brigitte can infer quite a few details from the bones they have collected. It's about the size of a chimp, a modern chimp, but its, it's legs were probably longer than a chimp's legs. If you see one walking around or, or in, the, in, in this environment, you wouldn't have said, ah, oh, there's a man or a woman. You would have said, there's something a little bit like a human, but not really like a modern one. Creating an overall picture of an extinct animal is an immense challenge. But there are many characteristics that can be deduced. The teeth are an excellent starting point for they reveal vital information about a creature's life and diet. Gary Schwartz from Georgetown University is an expert on ancient teeth. One of the really interesting things about teeth is that they are the only part of the skeletal system that comes into contact with the outside world on a daily basis. Now what's interesting about the auroran find is the back teeth tend to have features that seem to resemble the modern human condition, while the front teeth tend to have features which resemble modern chimpanzees. In a six million year old animal, scientists would expect all the teeth to be ape-like, but Aurorin's back teeth are surprisingly similar to our own. The CAT scan shows that just like ours, they are small, and have a thick layer of enamel, the tough outer coating. The shape of teeth tells you a lot about the food that that particular animal is eating. An animal that eats mostly leaves tends to have teeth that are very sharp and crested, and those sharp crests tend to slice through the tough leafy material. On the other hand, animals that eat lots of tough, hard, nuts and seeds have low flat teeth which are used to pulverize and, and crush those seeds. Aurorin's teeth are of this low pulverizing type and so, like us, it was probably an omnivore eating nuts, berries, fruit and insects. Given the similarity to human teeth, it might have also eaten meat. But what other behaviors did Aurorin exhibit? These discoveries uh, of Aurorin are, are very fresh. They're very recent. Uh, we don't know much about the, the broader picture uh, in terms of how they lived and how they made their, uh, their living. Uh, but I suspect they weren't solitary creatures. I suspect that they lived in some sort of a group probably uh, in uh, multi-male, multi-female groups. The likelihood that they lived in mixed sex groups comes from the study of our modern cousins. Virtually every living primate displays a similar sort of social behavior, and researchers are only just beginning to understand the complex societies formed by the higher apes. But with communal living so prevalent in modern primates, it stands to reason that the development of the behavior is not recent. Aurorin was almost certainly a social beast, even if it had yet to develop in other ways. This is certainly a long, long time before the manufacture of stone tools, which don't really appear in the 
uh, archaeological record till about 2.5 million years ago. So these these are pre-stone tool makers by a, a, a long shot. Although they did not use tools, there is evidence that Aurorin was well adapted for movement in the trees. This humerus, or arm bone, shows that Aurorin was a good climber. The large flare at its lower end provides the attachment for the powerful arm muscles that a tree-dwelling animal needs. And the finger bone is curved, a feature that all modern apes share, because permanently curved hands are better for holding on to branches. I suspect it might not have been unreasonable to think that they may have made nests and slept in the trees. Uh, chimpanzees certainly do that, and being off the ground would have added uh, an additional element of safety. But even this precaution would not have put Aurora in out of danger. There is evidence that fierce predators were on the prowl, and often successful. These shallow depressions are tooth marks probably from an ancient species of big cat. It looks as though the Orin fell prey to some carnivore on a reasonably regular basis. We found the finger bones of a large carnivore, which are slightly larger than that, but, and then we found um, one of the teeth, one of the, the carnassial tooth, the carnassial tooth. It, which is the razor-like tooth that is used for shearing the flesh. A carnivore like a leopard would fit the bill, because it's, it's not only preying on ground animals like impalas, but it's also getting colobus monkeys from the trees, and maybe orrorin from the trees or from the ground. Then bringing them to a central place, maybe to its favorite tree where it stores its prey up, hanging, hanging the prey up in the trees. And that's why there's such a concentration there. By gathering its prey to one location, the ancient predator unwittingly provided us with the remains of a pre-human ancestor, and also with clues about how, when, and where this bipedal creature evolved from the apes. The evidence is compelling. Auroran moved and lived both on the ground and in the trees six million years ago. Yet Martin and Brigitte have an even bolder claim. They believe that Aurorin is actually more similar to humans than Don Johansson's famous find. That Aurorin is more directly related to us than Lucy is. Although there is disagreement among the experts, some believe that more than one species of early humans existed simultaneously, much like Neanderthals and modern humans did more recently. Ian Tattersall has spent much of his life studying the diversity of early hominids. Traditionally, we've envisaged evolution as a sort of a linear process, a gradual process of modification of uh, single lineages of organisms over long periods of time. Now we realize that uh, the process actually is much more complex than this, and it very much involves the production of new species, that is to say, new reproductive entities, uh, which can be formed in relatively short periods of time and which will then compete with each other. Martin and Brigitte believe this was exactly the case when Lucy was alive, and that it was not her species, but rather a descendant of Aurorans that gave rise to modern humans. They turned to a comparison of the bones for verification. This is a mandible of a modern human. And as you can see from the third molar, second molar, and first molar, the teeth are small and square. 
Now if we compare the modern human mandible and Lucy's mandible, it's obvious that the sea is bigger in terms of teeth, and she's a young adult, and the teeth are more elongated. It's interesting to see that Aurorin, by the morphology of its teeth, the teeth are closer to humans. If I want to compare Aurorin with Lucy, you can clearly see that the teeth in Aurorin are small and square, and Lucy's are more elongated, more rectangular. When we compare Lucy with Aurorin, there's other landmarks which tells us that Lucy was not the same biped as uh, Aurorin. The other main landmark is the shape of the two femurs. The short neck and head of Aurorin's appears to be more similar to a human femur than Lucy's does. The problem would be that you'd have to go from small human-like molars to large Lucy-like molars back to small human-like molars. So you're getting a kind of zigzag in the evolution. You'd have to do the same with the leg bones. More human-like leg bones in Aurorin, less human-like in Lucy, back to human-like in humans. And you're getting a kind of yo-yo effect in evolution. And we don't like that, generally speaking. It's not impossible. But if you have it not only in the teeth, but also in the leg bones, then you're getting two yo-yos makes it very unlikely. You would certainly prefer that in creating a scheme of evolution for a group uh, such as the hominids, that you didn't have to backtrack more times than necessary. It doesn't mean that no backtracking ever occurred. But Martin and Brigitte are confident with their claim that Lucy's kind became extinct. Lucy may well be on a side branch. She is definitely hominid in the sense of being a biped. Uh, she's part of this bushiness that uh, we're talking about, the family tree being bushy. But I'm afraid that her kind eventually became extinct. Whereas the Aurorin type of morphology carried on through and eventually gave rise to modern humans. That's what I think it means. Whether I'm right or not is, uh, <laughs> we'll only find out in the future. Until the fossil record is more complete, Scientists will continue to debate whether Lucy and her kind gave rise to every one of us alive today, or whether she was from an unfortunate side branch that eventually died out. As for Aurorin, hey, Brigitte, the team continues to search for more bones, hoping to come up with as much of a complete skeleton as possible. <laughs> For only with more evidence can Martin and Brigitte conclusively put to rest all reservations about Aurorin's true place at the very base of the human evolutionary tree. As time goes by, we will learn more about the remarkable set of geological and evolutionary coincidences that set this ancient creature on the long road to humanity. But for now, we have been given a first glimpse of our most distant past. Dig deeper into the origins of humanity at PBS Online for chats with experts, interactive features, and more. Log on to pbs.org. of the Dead was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.